Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, thank, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this conference. My name is Lijo Vargas. I work for New York State Department of Environment and Conservation. I'm also affiliated with the University of Albany. The PI in this research is Dr. Jared Enriquez. Um, he is an assistant professor of planning at the University of Albany. Um, he currently is at um, Assad's workshop in San Antonio, um, Texas. So unfortunately, he couldn't join us today. If he's not joined um, via remotely, I'm sure he he's uh, he's here in uh, spirits. Uh, we conducted a uh, research on uh, co-adaptation, pairing the relocation of plant and animal species um, with human resettlement. I'm <clears throat> excited to be on a panel focused on ecosystem and managed retreat. At this conference, I'm sure you all have noticed that uh, most panels have limited their discussion to adaptation solutions and mitigation strategies for the impacts of climate change on humans and human communities, but have not dedicated as much attention to the migration of ecosystems. Sea level rise is one of the greatest environmental drivers of retreat for humans and all other species as sea level rising species are moving inland. Storm surges combined with waves to cause extensive damage and erosion and can often significantly alter the shoreline and remove essential habitats for certain species. Although major storms often accelerate erosion, natural coastal processes such as wind and waves are constantly eroding and or building up the shoreline. From all the presentations you guys have uh, tuned into so far, I'm sure you notice um shorelines are mostly losing land than um gaining land mass and uh, most of the shorelines that are losing land mass they're situated close to very densely um, populated um, cities while shorelines are contending with increasing volume of water reduced precipitation snowfall and over extraction of ground and surface water are increasing Desertification for inland landscapes causing uh, the migration and increasing competition for land and human wildlife conflict. In both interior and shoreline areas, shallower or warmer waters are favorable conditions for invasive species and predators, thus compromising the ability of species to adapt. Landscape changes um, and urban de development may create barriers or even provide a medium for ecosystem migration, stormwater management, and new roads and walls create natural boundaries and direct migration patterns for most species, if not all. In many ways, maladaptation create the greatest barriers for many species seeking to move inland for neurophagia. As you can see um, from this image, um, a seawall that's um, constructed to provide um, to protect homes and communities uh, from storm surge and um, hazards of sea level rise. Um, it's also um, creating a barrier for salt marsh and other species from uh, moving inland within the intertidal zone. So how might Manage retreat present opportunity to reduce maladaptation, not just for human communities, but also for ecosystems to adapt to changing shorelines. Managed retreat is a strategic removal of structures and infrastructure from vulnerable areas to reduce future risk. This is an image from uh, Oakwood Beach, Snaggan Island, not too far from here. As you can see, the landscape and the ecosystem uh, was transformed. Um, in very short time, um, it's important to remember that it does not take a long time to transform the landscape and um, change the ecosystem to facilitate managed retreat. Managed retreat involves avoidance of risk hazard. It involves abandonment of land and relocation of assets. How can the land be returned to a state where it supports plant and animal migration? 
there is various tools we can use to facilitate manage retreat conservation easement is a great one down zone in um, another great tool flood biodes had been um, used um, a lot more um, in the United States um, oh, expropriation our legal and cultural respect for intrusion properties property rights have made expropriation quite rare um, realistically I believe all of these tools and more will need to be utilized to acquire enough property to accommodate um, inland uh, migration the methods for plant and animal migration differ drastically from land use tools constructed around human ownership of property plant and animals need human assistance to translocate or relocate across the urban development that prevents their migration or passage opportunities for pairing ecosystem migration with human resettlement through managed retreat these are various strategies that uh, we identified elevated wrestling homes allow passage. New York State building codes require that all new or retrofitted construction in flood prone areas have a target design elevation of two feet above the base flood elevation, even though most local governments have largely not maintained elevation um, allow for passage of uh, aquatic species. Um, Community space for learning. Um, I believe um, by educating the public, um, we help them make more conscious decisions about these issues that we face with sea level rise. Um, from lands that are acquired through biodes, uh, we can convert them to parks. Um, and some of those parks, they may have significant ecosystems that 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 support endangered species um, some of the lands acquired through biodes they can also be used to improve connectivity to conservation lands most of the conservation lands they're very rich in biodiversity habitat restoration so something like uh, daylight in um, a creek Well, those strategies seem like logical ways to pair assisted relocation for non humans with managed retreat. Land use planning strategies for managed retreat are primarily focused on risk reduction and are not integrated in policy or practice with biodiversity and conservation tools that are used for system migration of animal and plant species. Local planning practices utilize comprehensive approaches for risk management but biodiversity and conservation policy is usually carried out by specialists in separate agencies that focus on um, state and uh, federal policies. These are two research questions um, that we formed. What is the role of local government in assisted migration? How can local risk management approaches for land use become sufficiently integrated with biodiversity policy? Methodology, we did a qualitative analysis so interviewed um, government staff local planners NGOs and academic experts we, for mapping we used um, ArcGIS QGIS Google Earth, Google Maps ortho imagery um, we found ArcGIS and QGIS to be very helpful so far these are the municipalities we studied so far we focused our research on Suffolk County um, Long Island so what have we found so far? Thus far, we found significant efforts are concentrated on these species. While progress appears very modest so far, these species are also quite promising considering the level of endangerment these were in before intervention took place. So um, piping plover nests, um, there is few decimal more piping plover nests now than a couple de decades ago. Um, Oyster population is also coming back strongly. Um, oysters, they, they provide um, protection against storm surge. Um, so bringing back the oyster population um, is an ecosystem-based approach um, compared to building uh, concrete walls or hot armoring. 
Um, another good example of a system-based approach would be um, increasing um, mangrove population. Salt marshes, the equation uh, salt marshes uh, had also increased in the last decade. The increase in, um, in eelgrass population um, is also very promising. Sandy catalyzed funding and public support uh, for most of these projects. Uh, many need ecosystem protection and migration projects identified in recovery, they were identified in the recovery process. Projects, um, the projects that have already shown progress all began plans and studies before Sandy struck. Here's an example, Cedar um, Overlook Beach in the town of Babylon. Um, the, as you can see from the image, the beach started eroding um, way before Sandy, um, but um, the efforts uh, in terms of buyouts and buyouts, it, it started way after Sandy. Um, recently, the acquisition of neighboring properties happened a few years ago. Since progress is multi-decadal, this emphasizes the need to plan immediately to be successful at managing ecosystem migration. Local experimentation is largely species focused, fragmented and incremental resilient strategies for risk management will heavily impact the effectiveness of assisted colonization efforts. The challenges we identified, uh, warming sea temperatures can culminate disease and increase predator populations. Major storms can very quickly undo progress um, as we saw with Hurricane Irene. Local governments will need to update building codes that facilitate needed migration, something that's long overdue. Local governments will need more state and federal mitigation funding to acquire properties. We plan to continue um, our interviews this summer and we plan to wrap up our interviews this summer. Um, we plan to investigate how community members co-decide candidate species selection for animal population and migration. That's all I have for today. Thank you all. Um, and I look forward to your questions and feedback. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thanks for sticking around this late in the conference. My name is Selena Balderas Guzman. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. And in this talk, I'll be sketching just a few broad issues related to wetland migration uh, with uh, under sea level rise and how that intersects with development in the coastal US. So coastal wetlands, as probably all of you know in this audience, are really important uh, because they offer a variety of ecosystem services like habitat for endangered species, carbon storage, water quality, we can go on and on. Um, but particularly what's important today is shoreline protection, and that is going to continue to be important under sea level rise. And so for these reasons, we really seek to protect coastal wetlands and restore them as much as we can under this kind of idea of wetlands as nature-based solutions. But it's important to note that the coastal wetlands that we have left are really a small fraction of the wetlands that we had in the U.S. prior to colonization. For example, in urban coasts like here in New York, which is what's shown here, and other major urban coasts like San Francisco, it's very common to have only about 10% of the original coastal wetlands that we had. And unfortunately, sea level rise is a further threat. And many studies are showing that coastal wetlands in many re regions likely won't be able to keep up with sea level rise in place through vertical accretion. Instead, they're going to have to migrate laterally, either upland or upstream, in order to survive. And along the way, wetlands could migrate into upland areas where there aren't any obstacles, like seawalls, and where the land slopes gently enough. Uh, for example, in this suburban development in Connecticut. Or they could also migrate into rural areas, like farmland. And, but the issues with wetlands migrating into agriculture is something that I'm not going to get into today. Um, but they can also move into other ecosystems like forested or freshwater wetlands or coastal forests. 
And in fact, wetland migration is associated with a loss of these other ecosystems. But those issues are also something I'm not going to get into today. So regardless, um, because sea level rise is such a big issue for coastal wetland persistence, um, the ability of wetlands to migrate is a really important mechanism that we need to support to preserve the wetlands that we have left. But as you are probably already thinking, wetland migration is both a risk and an opportunity for human communities. And I think about those risks and opportunities through a framework I developed called the Vulnerability Interactions Framework. As the growing literature on maladaptation is showing us, an adaptation response by one actor doesn't always reduce vulnerability to climate risks and can in fact shift vulnerabilities to other actors as seen here in the one-way hazard arrow. And this kind of phenomenon goes by so many names, maladaptation, externalities, spatial spillovers, telecoupling, you know, insert your favorite word here. I use the term vulnerability transfer um, from Barato and colleagues, but there's also potentially the opposite phenomenon where there could be instances uh, where an adaptation response by one actor actually decreases the vulnerability of another actor. And we would love that to happen, right? And this is commonly called an adaptation synergy. So in this framework, an actor can be really anybody from human to non-human. So individual people, communities, institutions, whole ecosystems, or individual species. And in part, the intent here is to consider all types of actors and to make clear the relational nature of vulnerability, the fact that uh, the vulnerability of humans and non-humans is in part dependent on the actions of other actors. Now, uh, vulnerability transfers and adaptation synergies can also happen across a, a variety of dimensions, physical, economic, environmental, which we often study much more than social, cultural, and institutional. So wetland migration is already bringing about vulnerability interactions. And I'm gonna show just a few examples of these interactions, particularly related to managed retreat from a larger literature review that I'm preparing for publication. And I particularly focus on vulnerability transfers uh, with regards to wetland migration because they've received less attention than the benefits or adaptation synergies of wetland migration, which are all the ecosystem services I named in the beginning. So when wetlands move into developed or semi-developed landscapes, a number of interactions could happen. So for example, um, in uh, shown here, um, wetlands migrating upland are already threatening historic and cultural sites that are central to the sense of place, identity, and social networks of some communities. And this is exemplified in a case study of a black community in rural Maryland. Um, by Vandola and colleagues, and they describe this community, which has a historic church and cemetery dating from the 1800s, that is slowly being taken over by coastal wetlands. And the, it's really important to this community because that site is really a node um, to the communities getting together, um, having activities together, and their, their sense of identity. So this is clearly a cultural vulnerability transfer, but it's important to note that um, it, it, these kind of cultural vulnerability transfers are not generalized. So there are other communities that have strong ties to their wetlands, and for them, wetland loss is actually a vulnerability transfer as opposed to wetland migration. Now, migrating wetlands can also lower property values, um, which could potentially have cascading impacts on property taxes and local governments, which is something that, uh, you know, people in managed retreat scholarship talk about in general, you know, not related to wetlands. But this also happens when you have uh, wetland migration, and, and these are examples of economic vulnerability transfers. Also, um, they subject landowners to um, wetland protection regulations. And this is a key difference between having wetland migration on your property and just having flooding in general. So wetlands, right, are protected by federal and state laws. And so when you start getting a wetland on your property, uh, and particularly when you start getting wetland endangered species on your property, um, you are now subject to new regulations and you wouldn't be able to, for example, regrade your property to minimize flooding that would no longer be allowed. So these kinds of issues are particularly impactful for low income communities whose adaptive capacity is already constrained. And so they might raise questions of equity and justice. So if we want to protect future wetlands um, as much as possible, how can we do it in a way that doesn't overburden uh, existing disadvantaged communities on the coast? 
So of course, managed retreat, if done well, and that's a big if, right, as this conference has shown, um, can be an, ex an excellent adaptation synergy with wetland migration because it would allow wetlands to persist while also protect human communities. And after managed retreat, in theory, if people remain, they might have access to new recreational wetland areas, and that might increase the amenity value of remaining properties, uh, which could be social and economic synergies. But scholars also highlight some potential vulnerability transfers uh, between managed retreat and wetland migration, noting, for example, the potential for increased mosquito habitat. Um, which, as we're seeing with climate change in general, diseases like West Nile virus, for instance, becoming more prevalent, particularly in the southeastern United States. They also note the potential for increased housing prices behind the retreat area and increased development pressures on other coastal ecosystems. So it raises the question, if we're protecting wetlands um, through managed retreat, are we uh, shifting the development pressures to a different coastal ecosystem, like, say, a coastal forest in the process? So here, I'm really just giving a sample of, of these kind of interactions. And my, my intention is not to give a comprehensive review, um, in part because this is kind of an emerging issue, wetland migration. Uh, but really, my intention is to note that wetland migration can have um, negative impacts on people that we should try to address proactively at the same time as we're trying to cultivate the benefits of protecting wetlands into the future. And so given this, um, wouldn't it be helpful to get a sense of the spatial scale and scope of wetland migration on people? Um, this is a question that I'm actively working on, specifically the question of how many people today live in potential future wetland migration corridors and who are they? So based on a geospatial analysis of the coastal US, I have a very preliminary estimate of around 465,000 people that could be affected by wetland migration under 1.5 meters of global sea level rise if we account for wetland migration on lands classified as undeveloped. Um, so this analysis still has to go un undergo a lot of validation checks, um, so that's why I'm saying it's a preliminary result for now. Anyway, I don't think the exact number really matters as much as the order of magnitude, um, because there are so many assumptions um, and uncertainty that go into um, having the analysis that produce this number, which I'll explain shortly. Um, but it's helpful to start to get a sense of, you know, is this a large scale problem or not? Um, and if it's not, maybe I can move on to my other research projects. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how did I get this number? Uh, so I analyzed the results of a recent wetland migration study done by USGS scientists, um, Osland and colleagues. So they estimated the aerial extents of future wetland migration in, in uh, undeveloped lands um, in the coastal US. So I intersected their results. So this is, you know, at, at this scale, it, you don't see much, but there is a lot in this data. I intersected that with a decimetric population map of the US by Swanwick and colleagues. So a decimetric map, um, that's, so when we get census data right at the, say, census tract or block group scale, we don't actually know how that population is distributed spatially. So what Swanwick and colleagues did, which is called decimetric mapping, is actually distributing that population intelligently um, where there are actually buildings and impervious surfaces and not putting people where there aren't. So they have a data set with a, which is publicly accessible um, that you can work with. And I also tallied other socioeconomic variables like income, race, housing, tenure, things typically associated with social vulnerability from the American Community Survey um, to try to identify hotspots of where disadvantaged communities may be facing wetland migration. But unfortunately, I don't have those results ready for today. Um, but here are the results broken down by state. And not surprisingly, the Atlantic and Gulf Coasts have the largest populations currently living in these potential future wetland areas. These are the coasts that already have the most wetlands, and because of that, have the most potential for wetland migration. Um, what's maybe interesting is that the state with the largest population is Florida with 223,000 people. Um, followed by Louisiana with 72,000. Louisiana didn't do as, as high as I, I thought it would. <laughs> uh, I thought they would be closer together. Um, Florida is really like clearly just an order of magnitude larger than 
any other state. And of course, the Pacific doesn't have um, as many wetlands and the topography is just really different. So the populations are much smaller then. So Osland um, and colleagues ran their wetland migration analysis just on undeveloped lands, which is what most environmental scientists do in wetland migration models. But um, I think given just the monetary cost of shoreline hardening, uh, I think it's very unlikely that all developed shorelines will be protected under sea level rise. Mm -hmm. And this could be good for wetlands in that it opens up new areas for migration, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that could limit wetland loss under sea level rise. In this paper by Oslin and colleagues, they stress that in spite of wetland migration, we will still lose total coastal wetland area under future sea level rise. So a key point that I want to make here is that allowing wetland migration on developed land might actually be necessary if we want to preserve the amount of wetland area that we have now, which is already greatly diminished. Um, but as you know, I've spent the first part of this presentation explaining, that also opens the door to more vulnerability interactions because in that case, we're gonna have much more than the 465,000 plus or minus a big margin of error people that might be impacted. And so how many more is the next step of my research? I'm currently modeling the potential for wetland migration on developed land following Oslin's methods with some tweaks. And once I have those results, I'll rerun the population analysis um, to, to get a sense of, of a new population count and um, demographics to try to identify disadvantaged communities. Um, but also extend the analysis to other issues that might be important, like um, identifying the number of buildings, historic sites, impacts on property taxes, and um, other issues that have been highlighted as vulnerability transfers related to wetland migration. And for me, this national analysis is also a way to identify key places to do a deeper dive into local case studies supported by fieldwork. So overall, um, the aim of this research is to be proactive about identifying vulnerability transfers and adaptation synergies that might occur with wetland migration since it will not be universally good for all people and coastal ecosystems and developing relational adaptation policies that better connect human adaptation needs with ecological protection in ways that are just and fair across different types of communities and different types of landscapes. So thank you so much for your time and attention, and I look forward to your questions. Um, and please get in touch if you'd like to talk further. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's just coming on 4 a.m. Saturday here in Brisbane. So please bear with me as I'm still waking up. Um, my name is Justine Bell James. I'm from the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. And in Australia, it's customary for us to start presentations by acknowledging the traditional owners uh, of the lands on which we meet. So I'm joining you today from Mewa, Brisbane, which is the traditional lands of the Yagara and the Turrbal peoples. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge some of my colleagues today. So I'm presenting uh, work from a, a few different projects and papers today, but a lot of it draws in particular from this paper that was published last year with some of my colleagues from the University of Queensland and also some of my colleagues from the Nature Conservancy here in Australia. So it's some work that, um, that TNC funded. So I'd like to, to thank them for that. So my work today follows on very nicely from Selena's. Actually, we're looking at very similar things uh, here in the Australian context. So as she so well noted, coastal wetlands are absolutely critical, important ecosystems uh, all across the world in Australia as well. They deliver a host of essential ecosystem services. And of course, as she pointed out as well, we know that as sea levels rise, these ecosystems may have the capacity to adapt either horizontally or vertically provided of course that the pace of sea level rise does not outpace their ability to adapt. Uh, and also of course, provided that they're not prevented from horizontally migrating by development or by hard defense structures. And if these hard defense, defense structures or incompatible land uses are in place, then we know that they might be squeezed out of the landscape. Now, coastal wetlands like mangroves that occupy the intertidal zone occupy a pretty vulnerable space in the legal landscape here in Australia. So the intertidal zone here is the intersection of your public and private land ownership. 
And often you'll find that these ecosystems straddle the boundary as well. So this is a graphic from another uh, recent paper that we've published with my colleagues from UQ and TNC. Uh, you can see here that the, the legal boundary between public and private land across Australia isn't uniform. It does differ from state to state, but in all cases you have these ecosystems really occupying that, that contested space where we're not always exactly clear where ownership is. Uh, a PhD student who I worked with, Ashley Witt, who now works for TNC as well, did a study similar-ish to what Selena's doing, but, but a bit different. And what she did is she modelled all of the areas in Australia that will be needed for future inland wetland migration under sea level rise. But what she did is compared it against tenure. So she looked at uh, where these areas are held in private land versus public land and also leasehold land, which is a strange uh, beast that we have in Australia. And she looked at exactly what, what tenure types these, these wetlands will need to move to. And what she found is that a significant portion of the areas that we'll need for future inland wetland migration are held in private land holdings. So if we want to be ensuring that there is adequate space for coastal wetlands to migrate under sea level rise in Australia, we do really need to be targeting private land and looking at incompatible land uses on private land. Now, whilst we have the doctrines of erosion and accretion here in Australia, like the United States, um, there is obviously some uncertainty about how this will operate under sea level rise. And it's obviously not going to help us in situations where you've got an incompatible land use that physically restricts wetlands from being able to migrate. In those situations, the doctrine obviously can't come into play um, because the migration simply isn't happening. Now, this problem of squeeze, coastal squeeze, has been recognised as a problem in a few Australian jurisdictions. And this uh, section from a uh, state environmental planning policy in the state of New South Wales is a good example. So this is a statutory instrument that operates on planning in the state. And what it does is it relies on land in the state being mapped as what they call a proximity area for coastal wetlands. So they've done mapping of the state and they've mapped the areas where wetlands need to migrate to. And what they've done is overlaid a planning code over the top that says development consent essentially cannot be granted in these areas because these are areas that are needed for future wetland migration. Uh, and there's a similar law that's in place in the state of Tasmania as well. So these are a fantastic development and a really great way to um, aim to ensure that these spaces are left undeveloped, undeveloped rather, but it obviously only comes into play where there is proposed development. So where there is some active change of land use that's proposed, that's when it would come into play. The situation that we're obviously more concerned in with is where there is no active change of land use proposed, where it's just the current ongoing continued land use uh, that's problematic and that is going to pose a barrier to that inland migration. So planning instruments like the New South Wales SEP that I just looked at can't operate retrospectively. So in Australia, like um, in the United States, I'm sure as well, we do have a very high level of protection for private property rights. And um, there's, a, there's a very strong presumption against the retrospective application of laws. So the SEP and the operation of the SEP would be dependent on consent being sought for some sort of proposed development. So in this space generally, this idea of how do we change land use uh, on existing protected uses, there's been a lot of work on that done in Australia and a lot of work around incentives. So there's a pretty uh, strong consensus that you need to incentivize land use in these sorts of situations where you can't compel it. And we do have a really long history in Australia of private protected areas being created through, for example, covenants on land. And incentives might be available for this. So, for example, a landholder might enter into a covenant that's then registered over their land title, whereby they promise to conserve land or refrain from development. And in turn, they might get some sort of financial grant or a concession in their taxes or in their rates. And conservation covenants are an excellent tool. They can fill a really big conservation gap in places where our planning law can't reach. Uh, and there have also been some schemes in Australia whereby land has been acquired and converted to conservation as well. So these are all approaches that could be used in the coastal context to prevent coastal squeeze. So there might be an area of land that's needed for coastal wetland migration, but the landholder is carrying out some sort of use that's incompatible with that. 
And the, the prime example that we've got along a lot of the Australian coast is agricultural land, where landholders have put in place things like fencing to restrict stock access to water, uh, and this fencing will prevent wetlands from recolonising. <clears throat> so in these situations, you could look at acquiring the land or putting in place a covenant restricting land use. But when you're dealing with an impact like climate change and sea level rise, you'll be trading flexibility of that land use in the short to medium term with certainty as to how the land would be used. So for example, if you look at where wetlands are likely to be in 2100 and remove all land use from that area right away, you're potentially depriving landholders from beneficial use of that land in the meantime. And of course, we know the inherent uncertainty in these projections as well. So we sought to look for some sort of solution that would allow a balance between certainty, but also flexibility. So we turned to the US and we turned to the rolling easements concept and looked at whether that's something that we could use in Australia uh, in a legal instrument to allow for this balance. So we looked at it in the Australian context using the term covenant. So easement has a very particular term in Australia that doesn't apply here. So we looked at it from the perspective of rolling covenants. And as I said, we do have a long history of using conservation covenants in Australia. Uh, and in fact, Australia has one of the largest private protected area networks in the world. But covenants haven't been widely used in the marine context. There's a lot of reasons for that. I think generally all legal developments in the marine context lag pretty significantly behind the terrestrial context. Uh, a lack of regard for, for the importance of coastal wetlands, of course, as well. Uh, and tenure, as I said, the fact that these ecosystems operate in that contested space means that um, there's been a lot less traction in this area compared to terrestrially where uh, rights of ownership and use are much more clear. Now, there have been calls uh, to use the rolling easements concept in Australia. It is something that's cropped up in the literature from time to time, but there hasn't been a lot of traction. Uh, but we had a look at it and we thought, you know, something needs to happen. And with the developments that we've got going on in the carbon space at the moment, which I'll get to shortly, we thought this could just be the right time and the right incentive to use. So we set out to consider exactly how this rolling covenants idea could work in practice. We did a review of all covenanting legislation in Australia, and we found that there are no barriers in existing legislation for the creation of these sorts of instruments. Uh, and in particular, there are no explicit provisions, uh, sorry, explicit prohibitions on drafting covenant clauses to temporarily constrain land use. So that is to allow land use to continue for a period of time and then cease or change upon the occurrence of some sort of stated trigger. We also conducted some semi-structured interviews with some of the main conservation covenanting bodies in Australia. And whilst they all confirmed that they had not yet used covenants in this sense, uh, they all agreed that there was no reason in principle why existing legislation cannot be used to create a rolling covenant type arrangement in the future. So how would these work in practice? The main issue that we uh, tried to work through is how you would express restrictions on land use that do not come into effect at some time in the future. So the key objective of one of these arrangements would be to allow a specified land use in the short term, but require this land use to be altered on the occurrence of some sort of trigger. And depending on the circumstances, this trigger might also require the landholder to carry out some sort of defined positive action, such as removing or relocating fencing. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into these in too much detail, um, read the paper if you're interested, but we looked at a couple of different triggers you could use using either projected sea level rise mapping, um, high resolution fine scale mapping of, of properties, or also using just truly rolling buffer zones. So actually looking at what's going on on the ground uh, and, and actively moving in time with that. And there's pros and cons of each of them. And it's, it's really weighing up that cost versus flexibility as well. Now, linking this to the carbon market, because I think this is, is what's really exciting and what gives us a lot of potential for these things to get off the ground. So Australia has a carbon market, which we've had for probably the past 10 years or so, whereby proponents of certain abatement activities can become accredited. So um, it, under our, our prior administration in Australia, our approach to climate change was very much all carrot and no stick. So there were no caps on um, polluting industries, but we had a system in place whereby proponents of, of good projects, projects that would generate carbon abatement, 
um, could generate credit, uh, could generate credits. So they had to get accredited under our scheme. Once the abatement was delivered, they would then be issued with Australian carbon credit units, which could be sold on the voluntary market because we, we don't have a trading scheme at this point. Uh, the other thing that happened with these is our government would purchase those credits and use them essentially to meet our international climate commitments. Now, the key requirement to engaging with this scheme is that you need to get accredited. And in order to be accredited, the particular abatement activity that you are doing needs to be covered by a legislative methodology determination. So the method is essential, uh, no method, no participation. Now, until 2022, there was no method available for any sort of abatement activity in the coastal and marine environment. So I was part of a large team that worked very closely with our federal government over a number of years to work up um, the very first blue carbon method, which came into effect in January 2022, which was a, a real turning point and a complete watershed moment, I think, for marine and coastal restoration here in Australia. So this method accredits one particular type of activity, which is reintroduction of tidal flows. So we have a really long history in Australia of building buns like this one on the screen here to increase agricultural productivity. So what these do, they're built over tidal creeks or along land. Uh, they hold water in the wet season. It then dries out during the dry season and leaves green pasture so that you can effectively graze cattle year round. But in turn, what these bunding uh, situations do is they choke out tidal influence and they've led to a really significant loss of saline wetlands over the past um, you know, 50 or so years in Australia. But in turn, if you take these down, uh, you reintroduce the tides, the wetlands will come back and you get a carbon credit. So we now have a method in place whereby proponents can be accredited to do this. And there are further methods in the, in the works. So we saw this as something that the rolling easements could work in conjunction with, um, but we're also doing a lot of thinking about the prospect of working up uh, an entirely new method for these sorts of projects of, of working in conjunction with the rolling easement concept. So look, in summary, as we all know, um, the need for, for restoration is absolutely critical at the moment with things like the UN Decade on Restoration and the 30 by 30 commitment. We know coastal wetlands are of critical importance. We need to manage them. We need to actively restore them, but we also need to be making sure that there is space for them to move. And I think our blue carbon methodology that we've got in Australia is such an exciting development. It's going to lead to, to positive change and it already is leading to significant interest in the wide scale restoration of, of wetlands here in Australia. And um, yeah, we'll be looking very closely at this prospect of developing a new method to work in conjunction with this rolling easement work that we've been doing. Um, so, so that's all for today. Thank you so much for listening and watch this space. As I said, there's a lot of really exciting stuff happening in Australia at the moment. Thank you. Hello folks. Um, please let me know if you can't hear me, otherwise I'll just continue. My name is Kate Sharon. Uh, Thank you for sticking around for this session. Um, it's hard on the last session of the last day. I'm a professor in the School for Resource and Environmental Studies on the East Coast of Canada here in Dalhousie. Um, it is where we kind of call it uh, Mi'kma'ki, the land of the ancestral, um, uh, ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I'm just gonna move some things around so I can see what I'm doing. Um, the project I'm talking about today is NSERC ResNet, which is uh, actually a subset of the NSERC ResNet project, which is the Bay of Fundy case study of that national project where sea level rise and, and increasing storm action is requiring a rethink of our coastal agricultural dikeland system. Um, this presentation includes work from many others who are named here and who I thank for their collaboration and just being generally great people. So what am I talking about when I talk about these dike lands? They're variously spelled in the, U in, in, in the Netherlands. They would be called polders, for instance, and they would be very different in scale, much larger. Here in Nova Scotia, the dike lands I'm referring to were once tidal wetlands uh, until early French settlers in the 1600s decided quite cleverly to dike and drain those for agriculture rather than clearing our very shallow and acidic upland forests for agriculture. Um, the system has been expanded in the years since, and that has extirpated in many places our, our salt marshes. They say that maybe between 20 and 50% um, of the salt marshes left in this area. 
While they're not exclusively used for agriculture anymore, um, they still represent some of our best agricultural land. Um, but residential and commercial pressure in the meantime means that uh, there is a lot more happening behind, behind these dikes now than used to be happening. Nevertheless, um, they remain in the control of the Department of Agriculture. Uh, that department cannot afford to maintain all the dike lens, and you'll see photos and kind of why it's, it's challenging uh, for climate change conditions. So right now there's a big capital campaign underway to modernize the system, and that will involve some raising of dikes uh, for new conditions. Uh, it will involve um, some removal and some what we call managed realignment. And so I'll use a term of managed realignment or dike realignment or MR, where the dikes are actually pulled back uh, from the coast and tidal wetland is restored in front. Um, so the areas that you can see in kind of charcoal here on this map are areas on the Nova Scotia side that are dikeland. And you can see that they're up at the top of the Bay of Fundy. The Bay of Fundy is at the top of the Gulf of Maine, which is not too far from where you are now. And it is a hypertidal system, very, very sedimentary. And when things happen in that system, they happen pretty quickly. So this is what managed realignment looks like. This is one of our sites. There are physical sites that are, um, are, are being realigned. And in, in CERC ResNet, we are basically wrapping a kind of science program around that to kind of understand what's happening in terms of what the trade-offs are of these decisions. So this site is at Belcher. And you can see that the old dike is in a dotted dark line. Uh, and the new dike is in a white solid line. As so you can see that there's a section on the outside that was once quite a lot of infrastructure. And so the department wants to reduce their infrastructure kind of burden. Um, and so has, has shortened the length of that, maintaining some active agriculture, but also finding making some spots where wetland can be restored in this um, estuarine kind of uh, system. And on the right-hand side of this image, you can see where restoration is happening. The, uh, the, the top is where it was just immediately post-breach. And three years later, you can see how fast the restoration is happening uh, below that. This is a very small example. There are also some quite large examples. This one is at Truro Onslow, and you can see here, and I'm not sure if you can see my, my mouse, but I'll just say that the right-hand side, you can see kind of those linear features of ditches still showing up, um, uh, even though this area has been opened up to tidal flow. It can be a little bit easier to see on the engineering diagram where we can see the original dike was this long length. And this is an area that has chronic flooding problems. They have replaced that with a new dike here to protect a loyalist cemetery about 200 years old and a bit around the, um, there's a railway line here. The rest of this lowland area has been opened up to tidal flow again, you can see these yellow bits are where dike has been actually removed to try to get water in there to restore that wetland. So what we want to do is kind of understand the implications of dike decision making in the face of climate change, looking at almost accounting, but not financially, the dike land, the area behind the dike, which is not only agricultural anymore, although it is in this photo, the dike itself, um, this one doesn't show a lot of kind of trail use on top of it, but many of them do. They're heavily used um, for access to the coast. And then the tidal wetland. And again, not all tidal wetland is sitting in front of a dike like this, but when it is, it provides great pr protection for that dike. And where um, sea level rise is often happening, and, and, and we've already heard a lot about coastal squeeze, and that tidal wetland is, is being reduced. If dikes need to be raised, the footings need to be widened considerably as well. So there's a cost there. So I'm going to take this picture and I'm just going to spin it <laughs> for a second. So what we wanted to do at the outset of the ResNet project is understand ecosystem service flows from each of the alternative land uses at that project outset. And I'm talking about the ResNet project outset, not the real realignment project. And so spinning here, we see the upland features like the ditches and the dike and the abwato, which are the one-way gates that keep the salt water from coming in, but allow the fresh water to drain. Those uh, are up at the top. And at the bottom, we see the wetland features. And so what we tried to do as a baseline is map flow to ecosystem services. And I think in my head, it was a much simpler system. It would be um, something like dike lands are about agriculture and wetlands are about, um, you know, uh, 
regulating features. But this is actually what we found when we looked through the literature. And don't worry, you don't need to really see this in detail because the mess itself is the message. So the black lines are the ones that we think are positive relationships. Red lines are ones that we think are negative, so where there's a hampering in ecosystem service. And dotted ones are ones that we don't really understand yet, but we think might be happening. So, I mean, you can see here pretty quickly that supply of all three of these broad categories. So provisioning ecosystem services, when we talk about things like water and um, timber, for instance, cultural services are in the middle, things like recreation and kind of uh, uh, relationships and social bonds. And at the bottom are these moderating effects of ecosystems. You can see that each of those, it relates to both anthropogenic actions and natural processes in all of these systems. And even if you just kind of look at just the cultural ones, which I'll do for the rest of this presentation, you can see it's complicated. Um, we get uh, a lot, the ones that we're most sure of are coming from the dike lands. And I'll tell you why coming up, because that's where a lot of the research has kind of been done so far. But we can see that there are some other relationships that are likely associated with both the dike lands and uh, the salt marshes. And you can also see that beneficiaries may differ. For instance, settler identity and Mi'kmaq identity are two very different, um, have hypothesized to be two very different sources. Um, so this is what we're working on now in ResNet. And we've got these great students who have been working on this. Emily Wells has finished. She did collaborative traditional knowledge interviews with the Mi'kmaq to try to fill that gap. On the right-hand side, Brandon Champagne, he spoke to actually Dykeland landowners, which is not a large group of people, but they obviously have a very clear stake in the future of that area. Um, in the middle is Sam Howard, who's still in her program, and she ran a population survey um, to get kind of a population level of understanding of how people feel about managed realignment and their support for dike realignment. And so just to take a step back before the ResNet project, I ran a, a, a project in 2015 that showed, that used Q method and showed that in fact, um, we, it was really hard to see a, a strong wetland constituency in this region. The strongest factor in that study um, sh was a very gendered one, I should say, that was significantly female, but it was a very strong dike land support. Um, reasons of flood control, culture, recreation, and food security. Wetland support was not because of how great wetlands are. Wetland support was about efficiency. It was about if the if the dikes aren't serving a purpose anymore, we should get rid of them. And that was a strongly male discourse. A few years later, we used Instagram. And so we got a bit of a younger perspective. And we actually strangely got a similar story. The dikes and the dikelands were the strongest signal out of there for reasons of recreation, heritage, aesthetics, and being with people. And that was, again, mostly female posters. The any mentions of marsh or wetland in that data set were about freshwater wetlands. There were photos that included um, salt marsh, but it wasn't being named. It's almost like people didn't see or understand what that was. And so we're finally getting a grapple on this through a recent survey by Sam Howard. And we can see here in the, we asked people about 13 different services and not all of them are cultural services. For instance, you can see we've got Keep Me Safe. So that's a moderating or a regulating service. And we've also got Producer Gather Food here, which is a provisioning service. And we asked people whether they got that uh, out of the 240 respondents, whether they got that from Dyke, Dykeland and or Wetland. They could tick any of those. And here we see that there are some that wetlands provide more than the others. That's the reflection, education, and inspiration. All the others were more dominant in dikes and dike lands, but, it, but there was actually a surprising balance. So we actually looked at to see how many, how often are people ticking all three of these? Because, of course, managed realignment, as opposed to a removal of a dike, keeps all these landscape types in proximity to one another. And so when people actually, two thirds of those who ticked, the ones that are listed in red, that is views, reflecting, sense of home or sense of place, education, inspiration, identity, two thirds of those folks, when they ticked anything, they ticked all three. Um, so that's interesting to us because it suggests that there's a bit of a value complex there, that these are seen to belong together. And that's interesting for the purposes of managed realignment. Now, people in this area aren't that familiar with the idea of managed realignment, so it's challenging to ask people about how they feel about something because <laughs> they, then they... You have to teach them about it first. And so we did that. And we had this uh, res this response that respondents agreed that dikes should be raised. 
They agreed that restoring marsh would help protect Nova Scotia, and they agreed that moving dikes back is a good idea. And first, my first flush of understanding that was that they didn't understand, right? They don't understand what we're asking, and they're responding to the positive framing. But that might not be the case. They might actually be indicating an awareness that the best option is a site-by-site -site decision, and that's indeed how that is being decided. And there's no one decision being made for the system. Each of these is being made on a local level. The only time they were less supportive is if we mentioned that homes or businesses might need to be moved. And indeed, there are some areas where homes and businesses are behind the dikes. Um, and But that was still only about 20% of people that were opposed. So that's good news. However, Dykeland landowners are not really in that mix. So we spoke to 11 of these uh, to get a sense. It was a bit of a pilot study, and they're generally not supportive of managed realignment. Uh, it kind of conflicts with their aesthetic, environmental, and agricultural values. And they're also a bit complacent about flood risk because of the long-term success of dikes in this area. Um, they're not really seeing the saltwater intrusion yet that is going to happen even if the dikes stay in place, for instance. Now, those who had some experience of realignment were the most positive, and that is interesting because it suggests there's a bit of a tipping point as this process becomes more common, right? And so marsh body governance models in this area actually give a lot of power to the people who own land. Um, they, they have to form a group owning land behind a dike, they have to have to deliberate together and vote at a three, two thirds majority for any change. So even though the dike system is run and managed by the, the Department of Agriculture, they can't realign unless the marsh body votes that they can. And so this means that as this becomes more common, it's possible that, and they see good outcomes or they don't at least hear bad outcomes, then that might be a cognitive shortcut that makes it easier to accomplish in new places. However, um, if it goes badly anywhere, then, it, then the opposite could happen. So um, a complicated story is around the Mi'kmaq traditional knowledge interviews that really demonstrated uh, that wetland restoration is an act of reconciliation. The tidal wetlands were seen by the participants, the elders who participated, as providing habitat nourishment for Umsit Nogama, which is their term for sort of those kin-based relationships with living and non-living world. And that the tidal wetlands align with Ndugalump, sustainability as a natural and nourishing system, and certainly as the home of sweetgrass. The only thing that could really be said for dike lands is that they currently protect a lot of archaeological materials um, that would be disrupted um, through dike realignment, because you actually get a lot of big diggers in to do that kind of work. Um, so in fact, it's, a, it's an act of rec reconciliation. So summing up, managed realignment might not be well understood, but it's, it, the tidal wetlands are also not yet well understood. I do think that this is changing. So those past studies might not just have been methodologically not able to identify that constituency, but that constituency itself is changing. It's becoming larger because of the way we talk about salt marshes these days. The trade-offs clearly affect different beneficiaries in different ways. And I've sort of talked about the Dykeland landowners, very pro-Dyke Mi'kmaq people, very pro-tidal wetland. And everybody else is you know, mostly seeing these as things that belong together. Um, our next steps are to model social dimensions under future scenarios, but we're also going to be resurveying uh, because we didn't get the diversity of participants to our survey uh, as we were hoping, and we really want to disaggregate and understand beneficiaries and tackle some of those equity uh, issues. Um, so thank you very much for your attention, and I'll hand back, uh, back over. Thanks. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for sticking it out to the very last session of the last day. And honestly, I'm so pleased to be part of this session. I was taking furious notes over there because I feel like everything that everyone else said was just like such a great intro to what I'm going to talk about, which has a lot of similarities. Um, so my name is Alyssa Mann. I'm the Climate Resilience Project Director at the Nature Conservancy in California. The challenge that I really think about every day is how to accelerate the pace and scale of nature-based solutions and the many benefits that they can provide, including hazard resilience, and how to get them on the, in the ground, in the places, and for the communities that really need them the most. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how I'm thinking, do you need something? Okay, uh, so how I'm thinking about strategic retreat in the, con in the context of my conservation work um, on the California coast and some thoughts about the roles conservation organizations uh, could be serving in this space. Let's see if I can get this. There we go. 
so climate change, specifically sea level rise, is a problem for people and nature. Uh, with five feet of sea level rise, nearly 60% of coastal habitats in California are highly vulnerable to losses and impacts. That amounts to nearly 90,000 uh, acres of California's beaches, dunes, marshes, and other coastal habitats that really support amazing biodiversity and really make the California coast so special and iconic. Uh, sea level rise is also a problem for people. Most people live in coastal counties with over 600,000 people estimated to be at risk uh, to rising seas and coastal storms by 2100. A study we did also looked at the vulnerability of the built environment with five feet um, of sea level rise really in the context of adjacent coastal habitat which found that over 100,000 acres are vulnerable. So I'm gonna dig into that in a, a little bit more in a few slides. Uh, but Cal so California is really facing a big challenge, but it is also trying to meet that challenge through strong commitments to climate action with bold goals and in investment. The state has adopted goals for conserving, creating and restoring coastal wetlands to achieve no net loss with sea level rise, which you can see here. The state is also devoting pretty unprecedented sums to make these goals a reality. I put an asterisk here uh, because these sums are changing um, due to the flip from recent surpluses uh, to a challenging projected deficit uh, for the state's budget. And actually just a few days ago, the state finally passed its final budget. But even with those funding clawbacks, it's more funding than we've ever seen for coastal protection and resilience um, being contributed by the state. So to achieve no net loss, we identify five strategies that must be pursued simultaneously to achieve this vision. On the left, uh, the four on the left will require uh, land protection in some way. First, we must uh, keep resilient habitats resilient, uh, investing in those areas that aren't conserved and, and really maintaining the conservation and resilience status of already conserved land. Uh, we also must stress the vulnerability of the ne nearly 60% of coastal habitat um, that are vulnerable to sea level rise. Uh, those will likely require protection and restoration so that they can adapt, perhaps, perhaps helping them to accrete vertically um, or allowing um, them uh, or allowed to migrate inland. Migration space, which we heard a lot about today um, for coastal habitat is really gonna be critical. And that means uh, allowing habitat space to move, which does mean into uh, other human land uses. So this is where, really where I'm gonna focus today, these two strategies um, and where we think there's really some opportunities for strategic retreat and adaptation, which has the potential to provide um, big benefits to both people and nature. So the managed retreat space um, is uh, quickly changing and evolving, uh, certainly since the last time I was here four years ago, but even since we gathered virtually. Uh, it is still contentious and controversial as ever, which you can see from these recent headlines. Some California communities and lots of other places are fighting even the mention of managed retreat in their community plans. But I'd also argue that there's more recognition that it's perhaps inevitable with tipping points perhaps approaching. In the West, uh, fire risk is putting the insurance market into a tailspin with private insurers saying they won't issue new California policies at all. Um, and others putting sort of insurance out of reach. I actually got a call from my mom last week and she told me that her insurance is tripling. Uh, so this is, this perhaps is a precursor to what's becoming really all too familiar in low-lying coastal areas and hurricane-ridden parts of the country. Um, will this market driver be a tipping point influencing human migration and retreat in places like California? I do think the jury's really still out on that. Um, but even with all of this context, we are seeing retreat happening, but I'd argue that it's really only a handful of examples that are truly strategic. Uh, we sort of keep pointing to the same examples and early implementers. Uh, one example that we've pointed to for years is a project in Ventura County at Surfers Point, um, which is a managed retreat and coastal restoration project, and has really been driven primarily by conservation partners. 
And the state did just announce that they're going to put another $16 million into the second phase of that project. But still, there really aren't enough of these kinds of projects happening. So not only is retreat to date um, mostly not been strategic, it's also not been equitable. Uh, inequity is already shaping efforts to adapt um, to sea level rise, flooding, and other climate hazards, as we've heard a lot this week. Um, we're seeing a dynamic in which project placement or investment is going to the most privileged, while the most vulnerable frontline communities are left at greater risk. Um, this underscores the importance of incorporating equity and justice into policy as well as planning processes to determine what kind of projects will be done, where they will be done and not done, and uh, who will benefit or be adversely impacted in the process and implementation. It's critical that we first understand existing distributions and how these may reflect inequity and injustice. Through understanding um, where we are and how we got here, we can better understand what needs to change going forward. So what's the role of the conservation community of practice? Uh, can their involvement help to ensure adaptation and retreat is more strategic, so getting more long-term benefits and more equitable, so serving communities that need these benefits the most? Colleagues of mine published a paper a couple of years ago that looked at how conservation organizations could help to refrain, reframe and deliver more strategic and transformational retreat to provide broader ben resilience benefits, restore healthy ecosystems, and co-benefits through, through a lot of different roles like some of these ones mentioned here on the right. So if the answer is to be yes to the question I asked in the last slide about if conservation organizations can help with strategic and equitable adaptation, it really has to be deliberate and part of the outcome that we're actually seeking. A uh, big shout out to uh, Olivia Wan, TNC's research fellow and graduate student at UC Santa Cruz's Coastal and Science, Science and Policy Program, who worked with us for the last term on understanding the intersection of equity and environmental justice with conservation and adaptation and how conservation um, could build these consider considerations more explicitly into their work. Through a lit review, some themes emerged, um, many mentioned throughout the week. Uh, first, coastal, coastal adaptation has failed to adequately consider frontline voices. Next, the distribution of benefits are leaving behind socially vulnerable communities. And finally, that in some cases, uh, climate informed land use changes can actually exacerbate inequalities. So she identifies three pillars that should underpin our, our um, conservation resilience work. First, address existing inequalities, do no harm, and promote land tra uh, transform transformative land management. She also provided a number of recommendations that conservation organizations can do, from examining the distribution of specific benefits and burdens of our conservation adaptation actions, broadening our goals and intended outcomes, and seeking to lift up uh, voices and establish partnerships with EJ organizations as well as pursuing uh, collaborative land, land management. So with all that in mind, <laughs> I want to bring us back to this slide and uh, the over 100,000 acres of the built environment exposed to two feet of sea level rise. So what do I mean by the built environment? There's a whole spectrum of type and the intensity of development. The intensity of development may also point to how difficult undevelopment would be and the ease or difficulty of restoration after retreat. Most probably wouldn't think about minimally developed areas um, like vulnerable agricultural land as part of the built environment, but this is uh, one of the areas that I am thinking about and uh, for strategic retreat and talk a little bit about today. So we're looking across the spectrum of the built environment and what we're interested in understanding is, are there places where if strategic retreat or built environment adaptation were pursued that would have outsized resilience benefits for natural habitats and communities, especially frontline communities? Are there hotspot areas in the state? What's the timing of sea level rise, the vulnerability or adaptation factors, local contexts, and who will be impacted by retreat and changes in land use? Uh, this shows the regional breakdown of exposed built environment by type at two feet. At two feet of sea level rise, there are over 45,000 acres exposed. 
Some regions in California are dominated by these minimally developed areas like the North Coast and Central Coast, where the South Coast is much more heavily developed and the, the Bay Area is really a mix of the two. At five feet um, of sea level rise, that total acreage statewide and by region of, um, really jumps to over 100,000 acres. And the proportion kind of tracks similarly with some not notable shifts. So as you saw in these graphs, we think these minimally developed areas, as we call potential future habitat areas, are really important uh, for much needed migration space to mitigate losses of habitat that are projected to be submerged. There are over 55,000 acres of potential future habitat across the state and together can mitigate over half of the losses uh, anticipated if they were protected and allowed to transition to habitat. Most of these areas uh, were historically habitat, but converted to ag um, over the, about the last century to agriculture. The map on the right shows coastal areas um, on the central coast. The green and reds are habitat areas, and the greens are really more resilient, and the red and pinks are more vulnerable. And it's really this orangey yellow um, that are these areas of potential future habitat. What I think is really amazing about this map is that even though it's projecting into the future, you might mistake it for a historic map. The ocean is, is trying to reclaim its uh, historic estuarine footprint. Also, also worth noting here that even though these maps do look stark, uh, these areas of yellow are actually a pretty small proportion of these human land uses. So here are uh, the California counties with the most uh, potential future habitat. If I click, um, the biggest hotspot areas um, pop out. And so what we did is a series of interviews. And while I don't have time to really go through all the findings, we talked to landowners, agencies, local conservation organizations working in these hotspot areas to better understand the local conditions, contexts, what might be needed to support strategic conservation and adaptation, such as funding, policy, partnerships, capacity. It was really important for us to understand these local factors because what we want to do is find win-win solutions where, we, where a community is really ready and incentivized to pursue through time a new sustainable climate-informed vision for the area and hopefully not see this as a grab by conservationists. I want to share uh, quickly about a project we are working on with local partners from uh, both the conservation and ag community. Uh, and this is in the central coast of California to really develop this kind of win-win multi-benefit project. This area, area was historically wetlands converted to ag land and actually some of the most productive agricultural lands in the world. If you like strawberries, this is probably where they're coming from. Uh, these flood maps show projected sea level rise and storm flooding for the area from the U.S. Geological Survey's coastal storm modeling system. The area is low lying and prone to flooding now and just will continue to worsen over time with sea level rise. And really talking with the growers on this farm, they are already seeing portions of the farm becoming marginal as salinity, flooding, and other factors are impacting productivity. What these ma static maps don't show is the depths of flooding projected and how they'll really be kind of perfect for intertidal estuarine habitats with intermittent flooding at first and a sea level rise continues the area will be perfect really for tidal marsh. With our projects we're working to develop a project that truly seeks to maximize the multi benefits um, possible for both nature and people. Some of those benefits in include improved floodplain function and risk reduction, reducing groundwater pumping, establishment of natural infrastructure to protect, okay, oh, I'm almost on promise, um, uh, to protect prime agriculture actually behind them, as well as carbon sequestration, water quality improvement, and habitats per species. And we think this could be really a powerful demonstration for the state, not only for these multiple benefits it would provide, but also bring the agricultural community along with us to code to develop this project and really the triggers to retire land and to restore um, as we march into the future. So I know I'm really running on uh, late on time, so I just want to quickly mention some of the, you know, whether or not California policy is enabling retreat for multi benefits. There is this program um, that's just in two years, um, kind of pilot stage to fund these types of multi-benefit land repurposing programs, really driven from the perspective of um, 
of um, decreasing dependency on groundwater um, sources, but certainly uh, um, applicable in a place like the coast that uh, is experiencing both sea level rise and reduced water scarcity. And then the last thing I was going to mention was that we did try to test some innovative um, legislation in California, and it's actually been vetoed now twice. Uh, to, to develop a revolving loan program um, to try this kind of buyout and lease concept in a place like California where we might have a little bit more time. But, you know, obviously um, some def definitely a lot of uh, opposition and struggles with testing some of these more innovative solutions. So with that, thank you so much. Want to recognize my co-authors, um, both from the Nature Conservancy and uh, from UC Santa Cruz. So, and I... So I think we have, yeah, we've got enough time. If the rest of the speakers want to come up, we can take some questions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelly Leilani Main. I'm the executive director of Buy-in Community Planning. And I really enjoyed this panel. So thank you all so much for your work and for your research. Um, I have a couple of, I mean, I have a bajillion questions and things I would want to talk about, but I'm going to narrow them in. Um, the, the one that I'd really like to hear your thoughts on a bit more has to do with um, the gradient, so to speak, of intensiveness of restoration activities in terms of costs from like a do-nothing approach on one hand and letting migration or ecosystem restoration kind of spontaneously revegetate and spontaneously occur versus doing much larger scale, heavy handed sort of restoration planning. Um, and how do you think about that in the context of your work and especially in the way that restoration opportunities are presented to potential stakeholders and the costs for doing this kind of work are considered into the future? So um, one thing we found out was um, since um, Hurricane Sandy, um, it, it, it was a big hurricane and it created the public awareness. Um, so people were um, willing to buy into um, biodes programs and um, significant funding came from FEMA since um, Hurricane Sandy. Um, in New York State, uh, Department of State, they also provide significant amount of funding. So um, yeah, Hurricane Sandy was a big catalyst um, in terms of funding and research. Well, I'll answer fairly narrowly, um, sort of from an environmental science perspective. There's a lot we don't know about wetland migration and, and how it'll work and where it'll work. So I think it's hard to know right now if you are going to need a lot of investment to promote wetland habitat or if it can happen relatively spontaneously. It, it is in some places happening spontaneously. Um, and it seems successfully, at least that's what I've read, more on agricultural lands rather than developed lands. Um, but I think there's probably gonna be a lot of issues like the toxicity, which you know very well, um, could be an issue to really whether or not the habitat can flourish. So I think in terms of ecological science, we really know very little about how it's all gonna work. <laughs> so uh, I would hope that we don't need a lot of investment and that it can just happen spontaneously because like we just really don't have the funding to restore the entire coastline of the US um, where wetlands can migrate. So, but who, who knows? <laughs> I think it'll probably be a mosaic really of like where more investment will be needed, maybe on more degraded lands and then um, on other lands, maybe less so. Yeah, I'd, I'd really agree with that. I feel like there, when we do nothing, we are seeing that um, in some of these areas, like I talked about that wetlands are coming back, whether or not the farmers want them to and they're actually having to do things to prevent wetlands from from taking root um, but at the same time it really depends on what are the outcomes we're really trying to achieve and whether or not those will need more um more help along the way um certainly to you know if we're trying to maximize things like carbon sequestration if we're trying to maximize resilience benefits it may take um some restoration so it really it's super super site specific i'd also say that like you know some of the 
there are places where, you know, like, oh, we just need to help the wetlands that we have today to keep pace with sea level rise. Um, and if there is no ability for migration and, you know, whether for topography or development, you know, helping those to accrete vertically, that is super expensive. And we are doing it in places because there are places we care about and are just amazing in terms of their ecological value. Um, but those are really expensive restoration activities. And so, and in California, you know, it's really different in different places, but certainly we don't have the sediment to support that. So I, yeah, it is a totally mixed answer, um, but it really depends on, on where you are. But I, I really agree too that you have to deal with some of the other types of stressors that are happening, like in the space I was talking about, dealing with runoff from the agricultural land. So we have to pair it with water quality projects. You know, so all of those things um, come into play. I, I just wanted to say something about uh, maybe Northern context that's a little bit different. And that is, uh, you know, while, while there's a lot of engineering and big diggers required to kind of remove dike and reestablish re drainage, you know, the, this in the in the, the Bay of Fundy system, the sediment comes in really quickly, and 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 restoration gets rolling. We have tested some um, some planting techniques, but one of the challenges is sea ice, and the sea ice will actually kind of come in and tear away. And so we are having to use some kind of protection measures and living shoreline approaches to try to kind of help in that intermediary period while the vegetation is getting established. And that happens in all cold regions uh, where we're trying to do living shoreline or natural nature-based uh, restoration, nature-based solutions. Sorry. sorry, I thought of one more thing too. Definitely when you're comparing undevelopment of more built environment, that is gonna be much more expensive than some of these areas that are more minimally developed or undeveloped in terms of being able to do restoration. So that's, I mean, why I talk about potential future habitat is like the low, the low hanging fruit, right? For where it would be easier to do restoration versus in some of these developed areas like Southern California, it'd be much more difficult um, to be able to maintain those um, coastal habitats in that, you know, much of a heavy developed space. I agree with Alyssa that um, can be very site specific. Um, what we found out was um, in Suffolk County biodes um, was relatively more successful than in Nassau County and that goes back to just the property values. Property values are much higher in Nassau County so it becomes harder. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, go for it. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Anyone else? No? It's the last day of the conference. Um, so a few of you spoke about this briefly, but I think that one of the really under kind of not only less understood, but maybe less discussed issues around saltwater intrusion affecting both agricultural viability, but also um, municipal infrastructure. So the maintenance of roads, the maintenance of sewer systems and pipes, you know, cemeteries kind of being unearthed, like the, the whole host of this really chronic an impending disaster rather than kind of the hurricane level events that we see where these really um, aggressive um, but slow moving disasters. Um, Richard Norton, who spoke about university, uh, um, he's from University of Michigan, spoke about coastal erosion in the Great Lakes. Um, they're looking to form what they're calling a chronic coastal shoreline crisis states organization, which I think would be really great for talking about coastal erosion. But saltwater intrusion, I think, is another one of these really big ones. So can you talk a little bit more, in, um, again, about how maybe to communicate or thinking about saltwater intrusion, the need for additional research and study on saltwater intrusion, um, communicating with municipalities either about, even in the built environment, the impacts, or with agricultural communities on sort of the longer term economic impacts, how saltwater intrusion can really enter this space um, and really you know, we can kind of bring up the need to be taking this a bit more uh, seriously or aggressively moving forward. Well, um, I guess I'll take a stab at that. Um, I mean, I guess from my experience, I can't speak too much about um, saltwater intrusion more generally, but uh, there is some science that coastal wetlands and preserving coastal wetlands helps to minimize saltwater intrusion. So 
uh, that's kind of an overlap between our session and, and the issue you're raising. So there is a potential for coastal habitats to kind of uh, ameliorate or at least keep at bay. They're not going to take away the problem. It's still going to happen, but it's going to happen more slowly if you allow the fringing wetland to maintain itself um, for as long as possible than if you let it go away. So maybe um, part of the education might be around the need for protecting habitats in order to uh, have shoreline protection, but also this kind of more hidden um, issue, which is why it's so hard to communicate about saltwater intrusion is because like nobody really sees it unless maybe your public works. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I, I mean, I, I can't speak much to sort of like public education. That's really not my field, but I think that the, there is a partnership between ecological restoration and issues like saltwater intrusion. The catch is that it's not just any wetland that's going to help with that. You do have to have a certain size wetland that's really going to deliver that benefit. So I, that maybe goes back to the cost issue that um, to to have a coastal habitat that's giving you the benefits you want, it really has to be a certain scale, which you know means maybe a larger restoration project than um, you might have money for. So, uh, yeah. But I think I think the um, it, just letting the shoreline degrade without any kind of habitat in front of it is you know not only habitat loss but also part of other cascading impacts that you can have. So maybe there's a way to kind of talk about all of those things together with the public and with stakeholders. Um, I can also take a stab at this. I, I totally agree with you. I think we absolutely are underestimating risk of sea level rise um, due, to, um, ground, um, due to saltwater intrusion. Um, definitely in California, there's a number of people thinking about that now. It's been definitely more recent and the science is really starting to develop to, to show communities what that risk is um but i i will say like the examples that we see in terms of agricultural land becoming sort of marginal for for um for productivity on the coast it's it's really because of that issue it's not the big um storms that are overtopping dunes and or overtopping berms and you know they they do certainly a lot of actions to be able to like keep the water table right they install these things called um tile drains that basically keep that from coming up but so there's a lot of actions you know a lot of people think like oh let's just wait why are we trying to you know acquire or protect land now why don't we just wait and see what happens there's still lots of actions that individual property owners can do that will make it a lot more difficult for us to do restoration later so things like installing tile drains um, things like raising berms and levees, right? All of those are much more expensive to undevelop later. Um, but I do think that these are the places where we're going to see um, sort of like that canary in the coal mine, right? Of these are the places where all of a sudden you're going to um, see those tipping points start to happen. So we're, we're at the end, but if um, perhaps some uh, final comments from our speakers, maybe starting with Kate online. Or no? Or <laughs> I mean, sure. I, I would just I would just say that I think in this rural area, um, it's well water. That's the big. Um, I know that we're not talking about saltwater intrusion anymore, but I don't know if that was mentioned. And I think that's one of the things that's actually causing people to push back against um, um, realignment and establishment of salt marshes is is uh, rural well water. Um, I think in general the. Uh, the challenges here and the importance of focusing, kind of going back to that Indigenous perspective and the importance of really thinking about this in, in the context of rec reconciliation um, and the, imp the importance of that entire community of, of kin, right? And making some decisions that consider that uh, would be where I would kind of want to leave this conversation. Anyone else? I'll make one comment. It's been really interesting being at this conference. Obviously, a lot of the focus has been buyouts and, um, you know, really a, a focus on impacts to people and, and how to get people out of risky areas. And I just think so much there's such a big opportunity for sort of this field of practice and that field of practice to work more closely together. I feel like so often the sort of what happens to the land after and your session was super interesting. Um, 
is, is tends to be an afterthought instead of us like planning from the beginning around what's going to be the future land use, having those community conversations, and then hopefully being able to build in some of these benefits because uh, it feels like a very missed opportunity right now. Yes, I totally agree with that. I think that uh, we we have so much that we can do now, even before these big impacts ari arise, especially with coastal habitats. We kind of need to start preparing them now to survive, not like 20 years from now. It's it, Our window of opportunity is going to be much narrower of what we can do just on the ecological front. So I think for that reason, um, it makes a lot of sense to me to really bring together, as you're saying, Alyssa, the, the human planning side with the ecological planning side and really thinking about those um, together and not as, um, yeah, just have one and then let's just see if anything is possible on the ecological side or just let a lot go. It, it, we really need to synergize the ecology um, with with the human adaptation side of things. Lito, so, would you? No? Yeah. Thank you. 